we're streaming on YouTube, we have no idea what to expect. Uh, so if things are odd or we get weird or, or connection issues or whatever, just let us know in the chat. And as always, I am joined by my incredible fiance Amber over here, who will be moderating the chat and uh, keeping an eye on on what your comments are and what's going on. Uh, I'm so very excited to be doing this today. This is an incredibly important thing to go for us to be broaching. And uh, hopefully, if all goes according to plan, we'll uh, we'll be able to save this video and leave it up for everybody for generations to enjoy. You can share this with your grandchildren. It'll be great. Uh, there we go. All right. Are we tilted? A little tilted. All right. Well, hopefully, also with the Creator Studio, we can uh, we can go back and edit this later on. So give us a little bit of leeway here, while we make sure that everything is up to speed and looking good. Can't tell me that's not pretty. All right. Now I've got us here. Sweet. All right. Honey Bear, if you will post a thing in the chat, we'll make you a moderator. So I should be able to do that. Yes, I can. And we'll let that upload a thing. Yes. Good, good, the best. Yes. All right. You know, when you see my head from the side, you realize just how huge my forehead is. Okay, with that, I think we're about ready to get started. Uh, so welcome to Ask an Atheist Day. It's an exciting day for everybody, uh, because as a science communicator and content creator, I get asked a lot of religious questions all the time. And so far, I've been careful not to address those questions, except for on other live streams on platforms like TikTok, uh, simply because I didn't want to drive away uh, people who potentially want to learn science, people who could potentially benefit uh, from the lessons that I spread. And the fact of the matter is, even when I do that, uh, I still very frequently get accused of, of anti-religious hate. Um, my video about why homosexuality is normal and natural and observed in, you know, several hundred animal species uh, was full of people telling me to quit hating Christians. Uh, my videos about evolution are full of people uh, accusing me of coming down on creationism. Um, my videos about trans rights being human rights are full of people telling me to quit pushing my science faith upon them. And the simple fact of the matter is... Uh, I, I am very, very strongly atheist. And that has absolutely nothing to do with why I'm a scientist. Of course, the two, you know, combine a little bit, uh, but they're not mutually exclusive. They're, 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 they're independent of each other. So for this particular episode, for this particular live stream, uh, we are going to talk a little bit science, but I'm really going to just try to focus on talking about atheism and on answering the questions that have been posed to me over the past week since I put out a call on TikTok and on Instagram for people to send their questions into me, and I've got a good deal of them right here, we're going to go through these, and we're going to answer them as best as I can. And before we begin, I just want to make a few things very clear. Number one is uh, a matter of respect. I have nothing but the deepest respect for people until they give me a reason to change my mind on that. Uh, I do not have any respect at all for gods or religions. And I think it's ridiculous to assume that for disrespecting someone's religion, I'm also disrespecting them or personally attacking them. That's simply not the case. If we can have an honest discussion about politics, an honest discussion about what kind of fast food we like, an honest discussion about climate change, an honest discussion about how to progress forward as a species taking care of this planet, then we should be able to have an honest discussion about how people think this universe came into existence and what laws govern the world around us, what morality is and where it comes from. Those questions should not be off limits. But as Douglas Adams pointed out a long time ago, these are things that you're just not allowed to talk about. Why not? Because you're not. And that's absurd to me. So we're going to have a discussion about these things. I'm going to be brutally honest about these things. 
And if what I say offends you, uh, that sucks. But these things need to be said. And please understand that at no point during any of this do I pose you personally watching this any ill will. Uh, unless, of course, you are intent on pushing on the proud religious tradition of forcing people into your beliefs. Then we're going to have a problem. The other thing is, why? Why would I do this at all? Why would I talk about atheism? Why would I speak out against religion? Why would I try to share my understanding of the world in order to take away from somebody else's? Why destroy something that gives somebody else meaning and replace it with something that gives me meaning? All of these same questions that, that fortunately nobody posed here, but I want to address anyway for the inevitable debate in the comments. Um, why do these things? And the answer is simple. Because beliefs inform actions. What you believe to be true about the universe tells us how you're going to behave, how you're going to treat other people. If you believe sincerely that the creator of the whole universe told you personally that homosexuals deserve to be stoned to death, you're going to act on that behavior. You're going to act on that belief. Whether or not you're a good person, if you believe this, you're going to do evil, horrible things. And that is why I speak out against religion. Because it's not just that it makes people believe silly things. It makes people do insane, horrible things. It makes people treat children badly, treat each other badly, to say the very least. And we're going to get into that a lot later on. But I just want to put out there, just at face value, the reason why I'm talking about this is the exact same reason that I would talk about any kind of politics, the reason I would talk about science, the reason I talk about sustainable energy, the reason I talk about giving food to people, it's because this is something that I sincerely believe is damaging to humanity. And we need to fix it. And I'm going to do my best to do so. And with whatever platform I have, if I can use it for this good, I think that that's worth my time. One quick thing before we get started, I am going to fix one thing on this light stand over here. I'm so sorry, but this is something that needs to be done because I cannot put up with that. A little bit of jiggle in the camera here, and we should be good. There we go. That should be all right. That's just, oh, that was going to drive me crazy if that wasn't fixed. And I don't want to sit here for an hour or two hours or however long we're live streaming. You're sideways again. I'm sideways again. Of course I am. And make that be a thing. I'm so sorry, folk. Oh, God. How's that? You like that? That looks great. You can't possibly say that. Look at that. All right. And it's great because on the stream that I see over here, I just sat down and now I'm sitting down again. It's perfect. All right. Beautiful. All right. So with that, um, we're going to go ahead and jump right in. I, I took all of your questions over TikTok and Instagram for the past uh, week, and I've compiled them all here. I did categorize them a little bit so that we can try to move through them in somewhat of an orderly fashion. Um, and Amber sitting right over there. She's going to be taking down any extra questions that come in if they're super good. And if we get through all these and we have a little extra time, we might just dig into a couple of those. Might not. Might save them for next time. Who knows? Maybe this will be a regular thing. Um, but uh, I want to crank through as many of these as I possibly can. So we're going to start right away with the definitions here, uh, because people ask me all the time whether I'm atheist or agnostic or what the difference is or how this works. So just to get some housekeeping out of the way, let's break down what these terms actually mean. First of all, there's theism. Theism is the belief in a god. Atheism is the lack of belief in God. So you are either a theist or an atheist. Then you have Gnosticism. Gnosticism is the term that we use to describe knowledge, or at least espousing to knowledge. If you are a Gnostic, then you know something. If you are agnostic, then you don't know. So you can be a Gnostic theist. I know that there is a God. Or an agnostic theist. I'm pretty sure there's a God. I believe there's a God. I'm, I, I don't know for sure, but I believe it. Same way you can be a Gnostic atheist. I know for sure there isn't, no, uh, isn't a God or an agnostic atheist. 
I am pretty sure there's no God. I don't have any evidence either way. The argument that I would make here is that agnostic atheist is the safest bet. And it's what I would describe myself as if I really wanted to get real pedantic and get into it. Um, because if you are a Gnostic anything, you need proof. You need evidence. If you are a Gnostic theist or an agnostic theist or, or a Gnostic atheist, you need to prove what you're talking about. I have proof there is or isn't a God. If you're an agnostic theist, you're still making a truth claim that requires evidence. And even if you say, I'm not really sure, you're still making a claim about the universe that requires you to back that up somehow. So agnostic atheist is really where I would land and where I would encourage everybody else to land as well. And that brings it down to the questions here where people ask, you know, what this is the, a, a huge amount of questions here. Uh, what convinced you to become an atheist? Why are you an atheist? Uh, uh, when did you start questioning religion? Did you ever have a religion? What was the, did you make the decision to be an atheist? These are all incredible questions, and the wording on these questions is incredibly important as well. Um, it, it just comes down to evidence. If I tell you that on the other side of this wall I have an elephant, you can either say, yes, that's true, no, that isn't true, or I don't believe you. And I don't believe you is different than that's not true. Because if you say yes or no, you now have to back that up with proof, with evidence. I know for sure there's no elephant back there. I can go look at it. I can go check. I have a camera, whatever. If unless you can look behind this wall, you have no way of saying for sure there's no elephant. So the best way to go at it is say, I don't believe you. Not you're wrong until you provide evidence I'm not going to believe what you're saying. That's agnostic atheism. That's how that works. Um, and when you look through these questions where people ask me personally about my religion, they all kind of fall around this central theme where people say, why did you make the decision to be an atheist? Really important wording there. I didn't make a decision because beliefs aren't something you decide on. Beliefs are caused by evidence. I can't decide right now that I think unicorns are real. And we're going to come back to unicorns, believe it or not. There's a question in here about that. Um, until I have evidence of it. I, I can't choose to just will myself into believing a thing. I don't know if some people can, but I'm not that kind of guy. I am completely led by evidence, always. Um, people ask here, what was your personal journey with faith? And that's very, very kind of them to ask. I'll touch on this, but I really don't want to talk about myself too much here. Um, I'm not that important. Uh People, uh, I, I grew up with a very multicultural family. My dad was Catholic. My mom was pagan. My grandma uh, uh, taught me all sorts of different religions. I grew up with, because um, she was a, a literature teacher, I grew up with little statues of the, the Greek pantheon, of the uh, Egyptian pantheon. I literally had Isis, the goddess, watching over my bed when I slept. Um, I was around Norse mythology and, and, you know, Christian mythology and, and Jewish mythology and, and all sorts of different things. I was around all of these things uh, from a very young age. And being around all these things, seeing them all, being told all these things as, as bedtime stories. Uh, I remember when I was in third grade and somebody asked me if I believed in God. And I said, which one? And that did not go over well. Uh, and I, I've, there was a time when I had sort of like a fuzzy, ethereal spirituality, which people ask a lot about here, you know, what about spirituality as opposed to religion? Um, there was a time when I thought, you know, oh, there's this energy in the universe and energy is magic and maybe it connects everything and it's like the force and we're all a part of it. And the, the thing about these claims is that they just don't stand up on their own merit. And that's when people ask me here, what about spirituality instead of religion? First of all, it's an incredibly fuzzy term that means something different to every single person who espouses it. Um, but also, the, these things, they don't have a reason to exist. They don't offer any actual evidence about how the universe works. They don't offer any actual insight into how to behave as a person um, or in a society at all. So... The difference between spirit, someone even says faith implies Abrahamic religion, spirituality is different. First of all, no, it doesn't. And second of all, there is no real difference between saying, here's this Bible 
and it says for sure that the earth was made in six days or, or seven days or whatever it is, and and that that the, this flood happened. Up versus, I have a crystal that can cure cancer because I meditated over it. That there's no functional difference here. You can put different labels on it. You can say that it's a personal relationship with something as opposed to a dog. You can say that it's it's you know something that you uh, uh, feel in the trees around you and all the. I used to be this way. I grew up this way. I grew up very, very pagan. We, my mom taught me how to cast spells and stuff. I, I, I just, there's no actual validity here. And it's the same thing as any other religion. There is no real distinction at all. Um, the only real distinction that I could guess you could try to make the argument you could say is that this is something that is so personal and therefore you can't be defined or maybe it's not as hateful as religions are because it's something special to you. But at the end of the day, it's still a suspension of critical thinking, which is something that we're going to come back to. Um, we might come back to these personal questions later. Uh, really quick, I want to crank out a couple of them, though. Um, any religions that I think are cool, or at least the followers, Sikhs. The Sikhs are cool. Don't agree with their religion, but they're good dudes. Never never met a Sikh I didn't like. Um <laughs> How would I raise my kids? And, and the, the question on this was about not just religion, but like Santa Claus, Easter Bunny, all these different things. I don't see a reason to lie to children on anything. That's why I'm a teacher. Um, what philosophical and moral systems do I find personally helpful? Stoicism and cosmic nihilism. Look them up. That's, that's my whole jam. Um, if not religion, do you believe in any sort of higher power? No. The laws of physics are what they are. They are not sentient. They are not cognizant. They do not have a will. They just exist. This is not a higher being uh, that's overly concerned with how the cosmos rotates, what humans do while naked. Doesn't make any sense to me. Um, and I think that's the... Oh, and of course, this is... Uh, what is your best argument or reason for why you think a god doesn't exist? And this is a really, really simple answer. There's no evidence for it. That's the whole answer. It's the exact same reason I would give as if somebody asked me, why don't you think leprechauns are real? Why don't you think that Bigfoot's real? Why don't you think that aliens live amongst us and are controlling the government? Why? Like, there's no evidence for it. That is the whole answer. I don't need some deep-seated touchy philosophical argument with 15 different premises and axioms. It just simply is. There's no evidence. Um, and here's the thing. If there was a God, that God would know what evidence would convince me. If, if there was this thing, I'm going to be parking on uh, Christianity quite a bit because that's what's around me for my whole life. Um, if this God loved me and wanted me to know it, and wanted me to be in a relationship where we, we were buddies and we were all friends, that God would know exactly what to do to convince me beyond a shadow of a doubt. It wouldn't have to be, oh, you didn't read the Bible right. You didn't look at the clouds right. You didn't see the trees and notice the majesty of the blood. I'm, I'm a scientist. I study nature. I don't need to see this deeper meaning. If this God is real, he can show up and give me a, a, a photo ID or something and prove to me that, that this God exists. If that doesn't happen, that means that it doesn't matter to that God either. Because that God, apparently, according to, to these religions, engineered the way that I was going to be born, the relationships I was going to have with religion growing up, the religions I was going to be exposed to, the, the people that were going to teach to me, this God engineered my atheism. And then chose to punish me for it. Not a fan. Um, so let's get into some of your questions here uh, about Genesis, about where did the universe come from? And these are all framed around the same way. Um, what caused the Big Bang? Is there a reason to disbelieve that a God could have caused the Big Bang? Where did all matter come from without a creator? Matter can't be created or destroyed. Where did it come from? Um, these are great questions. There's, uh, uh, can you be certain that there's no creator before the Big Bang? The Big Bang is the beginning of all space and time. That's what that is. 
You're asking me what happened before time started. So before the idea of before existed, what was going on? This question makes no sense. I, I can't possibly answer that. What was going on before the Big Bang? As to the idea of what was, you know, was there this God? Why complicate the issue? There's no evidence to suggest that that thing exists. So why throw it in there? Why say, here's something we don't understand, therefore it must be magic. Therefore it must be this God that did the thing. There's no reason to put that in there. It reminds me of uh, Laplace. He's a great physicist back in the day. Napoleon asked him, hey, give me like a, a working functional model of the whole universe. And he did. And Napoleon said, I noticed that you didn't put a God in here anywhere. And Laplace said, it works just fine without that assumption. And that's the case. This universe works just fine without the need for some god watching over it, supervising it, making it happen. So why complicate the issue further? And a bigger thing here, what's even more important than that, is that it's okay to say, I don't know. That's all right. Like, I don't know what caused the Big Bang. You don't either. That's okay to say, as long as you don't say, I'll never know and I never want to know, because that's just willful ignorance. You can't do that. You need to continue trying to learn. Or, I don't know, therefore it must be magic, because that's insane. Don't, you, don't, you wouldn't do that anywhere else. You wouldn't say, my car stopped working. It must be goblins. You would say, my car stopped working. It's probably out of gas. Maybe a spark plug came loose. Maybe the carburetor's dead. Maybe something's wrong. It wouldn't jump to, ah, the fairies chewed on the, the pipe again and, and, and destroyed my car. That's, there's no reason to fill that in there when you have something that could just be a mystery or has a logical explanation. And then someone also asked in the same vein, is it possible that science and Christianity tell the same story of Earth creation but in different ways? No. They, they just don't. Because one of them necessarily involves an external force, something beyond the confines of space and time that's able to form universes. And we just don't have any reason to believe in that. They are telling the same story in that now the universe exists, but there's lots of stories that tell that story throughout countless cultures. There's no reason to assume that this one is right because you grew up with it, and there's certainly no reason to necessarily impose it in this, this story of science in the story of how the universe actually came to be. It's just, it's, it's an unnecessary and irrelevant hypothesis that doesn't need to be there. Um, there is uh, another section that I have here is science versus religion. Because people ask me quite a bit, um, you know, is there any evidence that God is real? No. Um, what about science in the Quran? This is a great one. This, uh, the whole section here is people trying to find some sort of mesh between science and religion. Um, what about the science in the Quran? And I get this a lot, not only from uh, uh, the Islamic faith, but also from Christianity, where people say, oh, well, the Bible says this and this and this, and that means, you know, something about atoms. And that's what this boils down to. When you read the Bible, when you read the Quran, when you read any of these holy books, and you say, oh, well, this, this passage here is talking about atoms. And what it's talking about is like the small things, or like, the buildings or blocks or something. It's some poetic, ethereal language that doesn't really make any sense until you try to twist it and tweak it. No, well, what they're probably really talking about is this other thing over here. Uh, or they, they have things about where babies come from, and they say, oh, well, blood mixes with semen, and it's this whole company, and then that's not technically 100% incorrect, and they really meant it this way, and it's an allegory for this, and it's a poetry, and the... If this was a science textbook, it would just say what things are. It would just explain it. It wouldn't have to be some poetical thing that then thousands of years later, we have to discover the truth and then somehow find a way to equivocate what's actually going on. And to make the argument that this is written in a language that these people could understand, they could have understood if this God is real and is able to show you things. They should be able to say, hey, look, here's how DNA works, and write it down succinctly, and be done with it. 
not make some weird poem that we have to decipher for the next 5,000 years. That's dumb. That's a really stupid way to teach people anything. If I did that as an educator, I would be justifiably fired. That's a ridiculous way to be. Um, and also, speaking specifically on the Quran here, um, it, even if it did have some things that were somewhat scientifically accurate, it also has a part where Muhammad splits the moon in half. That didn't happen. It also has a part in it where a man flies to heaven on a winged horse. Pegasus isn't real. In Je uh, 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 the Bible, in the book of Revelations, the stars fall out of the sky and land on earth. Stars are millions of times bigger than this planet. The only reason somebody would write that down is if they really genuinely thought that stars were just little candlelights floating a few hundred feet in the sky and that they could just fall down and be right here. They were ignorant of reality and they wrote a story. Just like countless of other people have. A, you look at any you know, folk legend from any other culture. You, you, you're not going to say this is somehow magically real. This is a story. It's just, that's all it is. Um, the same, you know, the, the Bible is full of them. I, I'm more familiar with the Bible than the Quran. Um, I've, I've, I've only read, the, I've read the Bible plenty, but like the Quran, I, I haven't gotten to read as much. Um, and someone says here, is everything in the Catholic Bible a lie? And they make sure to put specifically the Catholic Bible. Um, number one, the vast majority, yeah, is, is just fairy tales. Um, but you specified Catholic, which means that you probably think that the Protestant Bible is a lie. Or that the, the new revised version that the kids are reading nowadays is a lie. Or that this other translation, the King James whatever, is a lie. And you have the correct version of it. So you yourself are showing that this thing has been corrupted however many times, and is at least in some way an untrustworthy source, and that you have the right one. We're going to get back to that argument later on. I want to keep going down your questions here. Um, is it fair to hold spiritual beliefs if they coincide with scientific truth? This is a great question. Um, sure, but then they're not spiritual beliefs, and they have no reason to be. If I have a deep-seated personal you know, spiritual belief, that DNA and, and my genetics are what code for my, my phenotype. That's true. That's not a religion. I don't need that to be a spiritual, magical thing that I can pray about. There's no reason to add that extra step in there. Um, astrology. What about stuff like astrology? I made a video on TikTok about this not too long ago. You can simply ask, does this have a history? of producing accurate, consistent, testable, verifiable predictions about reality. No. And nor does any of these other like religious claims. Uh, somebody asked later on in this, I, I think it was actually closer towards the end here, but I'm going to scratch it off while we're going over it. Um, what about the prophecies in the Bible? Uh, here we go. End of the world prophecies that are found in many religions. Um, they've been around forever. There's all sorts of predictive claims in all of these holy books about what's going to happen that's going to end the world. And for years, for thousands of years, people have been waiting for the end to come. And it just hasn't. And every generation, people say, ah, this is the one coming along right now. And it just hasn't. 44% of Americans believe sincerely with their whole heart that within the next 50 years, Jesus Christ is going to come from the sky and end the whole world. 44% of Americans believe that it's going to happen in their lifetime. And that's been the case for the whole history of America. Within your lifetime, it's going to happen. If you're religious and you're watching this, I, I would hazard a guess that you probably hold a belief like that. That within your lifetime, these end times are going to come along. And if you don't, I guarantee you know somebody who does. And I bet your parents believed the same thing. And I bet your grandparents believed the same thing. I bet you know people who are now dead who believed that in their lifetime, 
God was going to come down and end the world. It's been going on forever. So these predictive claims, they fail over and over and over again. And it brings me back to the same question as before. It's not just that it looks very wrong. It's if it were true, if this was actually what God wanted you to know, why would he put it in the worst possible format that is mistranslated 80,000 times so that you can waste your life living a lie based on something that he didn't clarify? That's a crappy way to behave as a parent. Are science and Christianity mutually exclusive? I would argue, yeah, as with any religion, um, because there's no overlap. And if there is overlap, it's not a religion's fault. Um, can someone be smart and religious? Can I believe both? Can I believe science and religion at the same time? This question came in a lot. Of course you can. I have personal friends that are Catholic and physicists. I know people who are able to accomplish this. The question is, why? Why would you suspend critical thinking for one thing and not for anything else? Again, you would never, ever, ever behave or think the way that you would about a religion about anything else. If I tell you today, if I on this live stream, if I tell you right now that I can bench press a car and fucking fly, you're not going to believe me, and you shouldn't. But if I tell you, well, I have a friend that saw me do it. Now I have witnesses. Still shouldn't change your mind. You should still want to see evidence. If I tell you, yeah, but I wrote it in this book. And in the book, it also says that the book's true. So you know the book's true because the book says it's true. There's no reason to believe my claims without evidence. So if you're going to go with that on just religion, you are deliberately choosing to ignore the critical thinking that you would apply to the rest of your life just in this one scenario. And that brings me to a really important thing that I want to cover. I want to take a break from this to cover this is that I, I don't think, I really, I can't think that religious people, all of them, are just dumb. I don't think that's the case at all. I don't think that you're stupid. I don't think that you're bad. I don't think that you're crazy. I don't think that you're any of these things. I think that you've been lied to. And the fact of the matter is, if you teach a child from the moment that they can understand you that the moon's made of cheese, and that good people believe that, and that if you don't believe that, you're a bad person, and you're going to burn in hell for eternity, and you deserve it. And you keep them to, to every single Sunday. You take them to a place where they tell them over and over, remember, remember that moon's made of cheese. Here's all this weird, you know, philosophy about it. Here's all these books that say, here's all this, the moon's made of cheese. That kid's going to believe it. They'll be a grown adult. They could be a physicist. They could be a doctor. They could be a politician and believe with their whole heart that the moon is made of cheese because they were lied to consistently over and over and over for years. That's what happens to the human mind. That's why education is so important. That's why science is so important because science is constantly changing and fact-checking itself to make sure we're not doing exactly that. So if you're religious and you're watching this, again, in case you came in late and I said this at the beginning and didn't hear it, I'm not trying to just punish you or speak against you. I think that you have been done a great disservice. I'm trying very hard to get rid of this system that is oppressing and hurting you and your family and people like you. You have been lied to about something deep and fundamental about the universe. And I'm not trying to come at you with like patronizing pity, like, oh, you poor thing. I'm just trying to show you that you're making a very different set of rules for this God than you would for absolutely anything else. And we're going to come back to that later because I know there were some questions of that kind of summarize or summarize about that later on. Um, someone asks, uh, and this this actually is perfect. It's just for that. What about the fine tuning argument of the universe? That the universe is so specially fine tuned for us, or even just this world? 
that, you know, this world is so perfect for us. You know, the moon in just the right place to make the tides, to make the thing, to make the, that the, 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 the atmosphere is just right for us, all these things. What you have to understand is that by making this argument, you're putting the cart before the horse. We evolved on this planet. And the way evolution works is that you become better and better suited for your environment. If you're not well suited for your environment, you die and you never pass on your DNA. If you are well suited for your environment, you live, you have lots and lots of kids with the same DNA that makes them well suited for their environment. If the environment were different, we would have evolved differently or not at all. If the earth were different for the past four and a half billion years, our evolution would have been different. It would have matched whatever the earth was. Or life might never have started here. Things don't have to exist. So by arguing that the universe is fine-tuned for us, you're making the grave error of thinking that you are in any way special. You're not. Nobody is. We are not built for this universe, nor is this universe built for us. We just happen to grow up here. And so we look like that. Uh, good or bad, what is the single best argument for a god? Great question. Uh, the single best argument would be the god of the gaps. That There's so much that we don't understand, and therefore God must have done it. And indeed, that's where a lot of religious claims came from, was lightning is terrifying, earthquakes are terrifying, uh, tornadoes, terrifying, hurricanes, terrifying, all of these crazy events, disease, pestilence, people dying of their wisdom teeth, their appendix burst, all of these things that we don't understand, we needed some sort of force, some sort of causal agent to make that make sense, because it was freaking scary. Now we don't need that anymore. And when you look at the history of religious claims in, in the space of science, you find, like, you know, for example, the, the Earth going around the sun wasn't a possibility. The sun went around the Earth. God made this Earth special for us. We're the center of the universe. And then Copernicus came, Copernicus came along and was like, hey, that's not accurate. Okay, fine. Well, God made the sun in the middle, but it's all perfect spheres and it all perfect little arrangements that totally reflects heaven. Galileo came along, hey, that's not accurate either. Torture him for a long time, don't let him say that. And then we go on further along, we come up with, oh, there's actually laws of motion and, and planetary, and like it all makes sense, gravity makes sense. Ah, yeah, but that's just the way that God did it. God does it this way. Same thing with evolution. I'm an evolutionary biologist in my jam. So like you've got, oh, no, we're all made just like that. God made us out of sand. No, actually, here's the clear evidence that, Ah, yeah, 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 but that's how God did it. God does it this way. Your God is an ever-receding little pocket of ignorance. You just keep making it smaller and smaller and smaller and saying, no, 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 my God is a little God. My God is a tiny little thing. He doesn't do all these big magical things. He just, all he does is snap his fingers and make things happen. That's all he can do. This is the worst, it's, it's the best argument for a religion when you don't know anything. But it's still a really, really bad argument. Um, which brings me to, let's see here, what's the dumbest religious argument? I, I think we've actually covered that a little bit. It's talking about, you know, that, that there just has to be something. There just has to be. We can't think about anything else. We can't imagine what the universe just came from nothing. That can't, or it's okay to say, I don't know. And it's not okay to say, you can't prove that this is wrong. Therefore, it must be right. That's madness doesn't work that way. You can't prove a negative. Um, I actually want to move this question to a different section. So let me put a little mark next to that, because we're going to come back to that later on. Okay. Uh, the unmoved mover and uncaused cause argument. So basically, again, there's some sort of God existing outside of time and space that is able to make all of this happen. Ignoring what I already said, that you're putting in unnecessary parts. This usually comes to the blind watchmaker argument as well, where people say that, you know, if you found a pocket watch or a book, you couldn't just say that this just fell into being all by itself. There must be something that designed it. The unmoved mover, the uncaused causer, uh, the thing outside of the universe that's much more complex that has, it creates these things, because any complexity has to be created by something more complex. What you're doing here is you're, you're, you're building a trap for yourself. If there's something more complex than the universe, then what made that? 
and you want to call it the unmoved a mover, the uncaused causer, that's the very definition of special pleading. You're saying every single thing needs a cause. Every single thing needs a creator, except for this one thing that did all the creating and all the causing. That one's special. That one's magic. That one doesn't need it. If you can say that, then you don't get to be mad about me saying the universe just popped into existence magically under no reason, which I don't believe because there's no evidence to suggest that either. But like, if that's your argument, then that can be anybody's argument and you don't get to say that they're wrong. So you're making a trap for yourself. That's ridiculous. You, you've made an absurd little box that you're just, all you can fall back on is I believe it because I believe it because I believe it. And as we've, I, I've talked about on live, I didn't get a question about this, but like, I do want to throw this in there. The reason why you believe it, if you believe it, is because you were brought up to believe it. You have to believe that you were born in the right place at the right time to the right family to get the right version of the right religion. Because if you had been born in Saudi Arabia, you'd be a Muslim and all oh, you'd be wrong. If you were born in, in you know, Viking times in, in Scandinavia, you'd be worshiping Wotan and Thor and you'd be wrong and it'd be terrible. And if you were born in, in you know, pick any other, if you were born in Egypt, you'd be talking about Bast and, and, and Isis and Osiris and oh, how wrong you'd be. But thank goodness you were born in the 21st century, in the middle of America, to a, a family that believed in these things. It just, you're, you're, you're building this very odd little logical box for yourself that makes absolutely no sense if you think about it for like two seconds. Um, so, let's see here. Oh, of course, I got one of these. Pascal's Wager. Um, someone asks, if you're religious and you're wrong, then nothing happens. And if you're not religious and you're wrong, hell awaits. So why not just believe? Here's the first problem with that. You're assuming that you can bullshit your God and that you can just say you believe a thing and he'll just be cool with that and like you can't be sincere about it and he's fine with it. So there's a big issue right there is you're believing that your God is something that can, you can just fool this way. Um, second of all, how do you know that you're in the right version of this wager? Like, all the other major religions have a hell that awaits you if you're wrong. So how much sleep are you losing about the fact that you might not be right about which god you're believing in? You might be wrong about Islam. You might be wrong about Hinduism. You might be wrong about, you know, pick a religion. But you just happen to say, ah, it's the Christian god. That's the one that we need to play it safe with. No. And as far as like someone asked you, know, is there other arguments against this other than God, which or other than you know, you might not have the right God, which is kind of silly to say, you know, what arguments beside the one argument. So there's three. You're saying that your God is 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 dumb enough to be bamboozled this way. Um, you don't know if you picked the right God. And even if you did, what what a weird box. What a weird box to put yourself in. Uh, I'm going to set this aside over here because I want to move on to this section. Morality. This is a great one. Um, science and religion used to be the same thing. Uh, religion is a good technology to pass on good values to the next generation. First of all, you're right. Science and religion did used to be the same thing. It was all kind of branded under the term philosophy. Um, religion is our very first and our very worst attempt at understanding the universe. When you read through the Bible, there's all sorts of like rules, God laws, that really boil down to like cleanliness and medicine and all the things that they understood at the time that are not applicable today by and large. So yeah, they used to be the same thing. Then we continued learning. The same way that astrology and astronomy used to be the same thing. Scientists used to look up at the stars, catalog and map the movements of the planets, and they also believed that it had some sort of influence on us personally. Then we learned that that isn't true, but planets are real, and so we continued studying astronomy instead of astrology. The same way that chemistry and alchemy used to be the same thing. We knew that there was some fundamental thing that made up matter, that made stuff on Earth. And we thought maybe if we did the right song and dance and we did the right mixing, we could turn lead into gold. 
that doesn't work. But chemistry is still real and atoms are still real. So yes, religion and science used to be the same thing. Now they have split and we're able to move on and we're able to change. Um, isn't a religion a good technology to pass on good values? That's just culture. You can pass on good values without the need for lying about these magical events. And furthermore, why on earth would you pull your values out of any of these holy books? Why? Why give us a book? If God really wanted us to have these values, if there really was some moral code that we needed to get from the Bible, and again, I'm just picking on the Bible because I'm, I live in Oklahoma. It's everywhere. Why would we stick with the book that condones slavery, that teaches you where to buy slaves and how you can beat them as long as they don't die within two days, it's okay. If you beat them hard enough to put out an eye, then you owe them. Why put that in there? Why, why have that? Why have a book that tells you how to sell your daughter into, as a sex slave? Why give a book that says if a woman is raped and she's a virgin, then the rapist just needs to pay the father 30 bits of silver and then now they're husband and wife now? Why have a book like that? Why have a book that condones stoning homosexuals to death? Why have a book that says, this is a real part of the Bible, if uh, two men are fighting and a woman tries to break up the fight, and in doing so, she accidentally touches one of their penises. You need to cut her hand off. That's an actual rule in the Bible. What moral code do you need to pass on to children that involves that? Honestly. How necessary is that? And you can argue that this is all mistranslated. That this has all been changed over the past... No, then it's a shitty book anyway. If it can be changed this much, if this is what we're supposed to base our lives on, and it can be this easily misinterpreted, that's a crappy way to teach anybody anything. If this God really wanted us to behave a certain way, and this book ain't it, and it's been mistranslated, why not correct it? Why not fix it? Why allow us to continue suffering? And if your argument is, well, that's the Old Testament, and in the New Testament that... First of all, the New Testament, Jesus never changed any of that. He specifically said, I come not to change the law, but to enforce it. I'm not a jot nor a tittle of the law will change until all things have come to pass and the end of times and blah, blah, blah. Um, so first of all, no. Second of all, he could have He very easily said, hey, by the way, human beings aren't farming equipment. No more slaves. He chose not to do that. In fact, he said slaves obey your masters. So that's awful. That's awful. Third, uh, if we're going to say that that's the Old Testament, the Ten Commandments are the Old Testament as well. All three or four different versions of them, by the way. It's in there a lot, and it's different every time. So pick one and then ignore it because it's the Old Testament anyway, right? And if you want to argue that this is all you know, man-made problems, that this is free will, that this you know, God can't reveal these things because that would uh, invalidate our free will, in the Old Testament... He violates free will a lot. Not only does he show up in person to tell people what to do, but he literally, it actually says in the pages, like, uh, for example, in Exodus, when the Jews are trying to leave Egypt, uh, it says in there several times, after every plague, actually, it says this, Pharaoh wanted to let the Jews go, but God hardened his heart and made him not do it so that he could do another plague later. Because I guess he just wanted to show off some more. And then in the New Testament, Jesus does miracles in front of thousands of people over and over again. Did their free will not matter then? Satan has free will. He knows more than anybody that God exists and all the things that he can do and still chose to rebel. I could too if I knew a God was real. There's no reason to be the hide-and-seek champion if you want people to understand morality. That's a Terrible system. Uh, and as far as passing on to the next generation, I don't see any good laws in there that we need to pass on to the next generation. Like, there, sure, you can find some. You can. You can sift through that crap and find some things that matter. Why? Why not just make better rules and just go with those? Because if you notice, 
That's what we've done as a society for hundreds of years. America wasn't founded on Christian laws. It was founded on secular understanding of human dignity and suffering. And we got a lot of things wrong, and we had to improve, and we still have a lot to answer for, a lot to apologize for, and a lot to get better. But it's certainly not based on a book that says that you should go kill everybody who doesn't believe the way you believe, murder the, the, the women, the children, the, the livestock, salt the fields, but keep the virgin girls for yourself. Because that is very clear in the Bible over and over and over. Kill the non-believers, murder the animals, every single body, but the virgin girls, you keep those. That's not an American law, you might notice, because we're not founded on these religious principles. So there's no reason to pass this on as a moral thing. Um, could a religion exist that guides morality and ethics and makes no attempt to explain natural phenomena? then it wouldn't be necessary to be calling it a religion, if that's what you call it. That's just culture now. Don't call it a religion. Why? Why complicate it? Is it possible that you have moral and ethical blind spots that you don't see due to your atheism that might be causing harm? That's a great question. I don't think that there's anything that would be a blind spot because I'm an atheist. But there absolutely, without a doubt, there are things that I'm getting wrong right now. I know for sure that in 50, 60 years, my great-grandchildren, whoever it is, are going to come to me and say, hey, this was kind of messed up, but it hurt these people when you did I'm, I am excited to learn that and to grow and to become a better person every single day. How awful it would be to live my whole life never changing, only having one system of what's right and wrong, never challenging my own beliefs, never becoming a better person for the people around me. Which leads me to this question, which I knew I was going to get. Uh, where does morality come from without a God, and what stops you from rape and murder without the threat of hell? That is literally what they put in there. I don't need the threat of punishment to not hurt people. And I don't need the promise of a reward to be a good person. I don't hurt people because I understand that my actions have consequences, that they are thinking beings just like me, and that my actions are going to affect their happiness and well-being, and so I want my actions to be beneficial to them. That's not a difficult concept, and I wouldn't be the first, second, third, or 10,000th person to say this. I do rape and murder everybody that I want, and it's zero people. And it always has been. And if your number is not zero, I feel sorry for you. That's a problem that religion should not have to fix. I don't want to rape or murder anybody. Why would I? And if you do, you're the problem. I can't make that clear enough. Uh, and where does morality come without God? We decide on it. We know what makes people happy and what hurts people. We're not dumb. We know what's good for humans and what, what causes suffering. That's morality. That You got it. You've nailed it down. Every single baby understands sharing. They understand theory of mind. They understand that you shouldn't hit. It's not hard to teach people these things. You don't need a God to do it. And if the only reason that you're not out here you know, hurting people is because you don't want to be hurt yourself later. That's, that's messed up, yo. That's not okay. Uh, um, these questions we've kind of already covered a little bit. Uh, what about scientists who are believers? Um, is science, can I be a science-based person and a spiritual person at the same time? Again, we already covered this, but just in case you didn't hear it, you're, you're choosing to suspend disbelief for one thing and not for another thing. You're choosing to ignore critical thinking for one thing that you wouldn't do for anything else. There's no reason to put yourself through these mental gymnastics. There isn't a reason. And then people ask about why did religion come about in the first place? What part did it play as humanity evolved? Why did we develop faith? Uh, why is it so pervasive for human culture from like an anthropological perspective? Um, it wasn't necessary a long time ago. Here's the thing. 
when you look back over the history of religions, you see that the earliest religions are like the sun. It brings warmth, it brings light, there's not enough, you, know, you can see predators, it's safety, it's happiness, it's warmth. This is the very first religions. Then you get like fertility and hunting. We need food and we need more of ourselves. Those are the next gods that come along. And like I said before, this is just so that we can give some sort of meaning to things. Humans are really, really, really good at identifying patterns, even when a pattern doesn't actually exist. That's just what we do. We're phenomenal at it. And so we look for patterns in nature and we think, oh, there must be some sort of causal agent. I broke this stick in half. The stick didn't break itself. So if this tree gets struck by lightning, the lightning didn't do it itself. There must be somebody throwing it. We'll call it Zeus. There's no reason for this in the 21st century when we actually understand how these things work. Again, religious people are not stupid. You've just been lied to a whole bunch with an outdated way of thinking that is immoral, unethical, and destructive to society. We're trying to fix it. Moving on. Because um, this is a great series of questions here. This is about atheism and people um, coming out of religion. Religion gives us a sense of community. Would there be less of it uh, 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 if, if we had atheism? Or would there be less need of religion if we could find something to fill that thing? Yeah, religion does give a sense of community because it brings people together, usually every Sunday, to talk about something that they all agree on. There's a million other things that we can agree on that are better. And there are a lot of ways that we can actually help each other and come together and make society better without the need to just chant and sing songs about whatever God. Religion does fill that need. It doesn't have to be the thing that does it. it it's like saying, what am I going to eat if not beans? There's a lot of other things to eat, Holmes. You can do whatever you want. You can eat it's so many things. It doesn't just have to be this one thing. So yeah, religion does fill this need. It would be so incredibly easy to fill this need with anything else. Uh, can religion be left behind without losing anything that humanity needs that can't be replaced, blah, blah, blah? No. There, there's nothing that you need that religion brings you. Can religion be left behind without losing something that humanity needs? Absolutely, it can. Very easily so. You will be better off without it. You can be good without God. And I mean that morally, you can be a good person, and like just like content. You can be good. You can be all right without this need, without this God. Um, is it normal to abandon the family pack and surround yourself with people who are like-minded, closer to your standards, not blood-related? My family is very religious, and I want to be away from them. Is this okay? Is this normal? Here's the thing. You, you absolutely, if you're like, it doesn't matter who it is. If somebody is toxic to you, get away from them. Just because religion teaches you know, honor your father and mother, otherwise you'd be stoned to death. That's another fun one in the Bible. If you're disrespectful to your parents, you're supposed to be taken to the edge of town and beaten to death with rocks. Um, just because these things are taught does not mean they're true. Does not mean they're true. So by all means, I've cut people out from my family that are toxic to me. You should too, if they're hurting you. Um... See here, is it possible for people to completely avoid religion and still have culture, government, and science? We've been doing it for thousands of years. We keep growing. We keep getting better. Look back at, you know, the difference between, you know, the Salem witch trials when, you know, the Bible was the old, or God, go further than that. Go back to the Dark Ages. Go back to the Spanish Inquisition where you were tortured to death for not being Christian enough or not being able to prove that you're Christian enough. Go back to the time when the church had power and they would literally boil people alive in oil because somebody said that somebody said that they were a witch. Go back to that. You notice how we're not doing that anymore. Yes, we can have society without religion. You already largely do. We just need to take it one step further. Because, you know, it would be great if we could stop arguing about who it's okay to discriminate against and who should and shouldn't have rights because you read in a book that these people are not really people. We're going to get back to that a lot here in a little while. Um, would the U.S. be better off if the majority were atheists instead of religious? I'd say yes. Um, let's see here. 
Do you need religion to be a complete person? No, absolutely not. Good Lord, no. Uh, let's see here. Okay, so now, this little battery of questions here is what I was you know, trying to, when I keep saying we'll get back to this later, this is the part that I wanted to get back to. Because this particular battery of problems here, um, well, they're, they're disgusting. And I want to ch just dig into them. So first of all, this one. Modern Christians need to get off their high horse. Jesus died for all sins. Gays are sinners, but that doesn't matter. Let people live their lives. And there was another one here where people say, hate the sin, love the sinner. Same vein. What bothers me about this is that the people who write things like this, they probably really think that they're on the progressive branch of this whole thing. Oh, I know that gays are disgusting, filthy animals, barely worth human life, blah, blah, blah. But I love them. I just don't support them. It's condescending, it's patronizing, and it's incredibly gross. Because what you're saying is, I know better than you. I have the book from the creator that tells me that I'm morally superior to you, that I know all these things. And you're just this gross thing that's doing these horrible, sinful acts but it's okay. I love you anyway. It's just, it's the smarmiest, slimiest thing. It's just, yeah, real nasty, real nasty. It's that underhanded thing. And it's the same thing with the phrase, because I get this all the time. People like to spam my comments and say, Jesus loves you. This is an incredibly underhanded statement. And I know that people say Jesus loves you, and they mean that to be a hopeful thing. Like, oh, don't you know? It's wonderful. Jesus loves me so much that he he you know fixed he lowered my car payments. That he fixed the, the I had a leak in a pipe and he fixed that for me. Isn't that great? That Jesus loves me so much that he made sure it didn't rain on my wedding day, even though it was supposed to. Isn't that wonderful? Now factor in all the things that this Jesus doesn't do. Factor in the fact that twenty four thousand children die every single day before they reach the age of five from hunger and easily preventable disease. And when I say easily preventable disease, I mean diseases that can be uh, prevented by clean drinking water, hand washing, and mosquito nets. 24,000 children a day, upwards of 30 on a bad day. Uh, uh, one way to phrase this, I think Sam Harris uh, uh, made this comparison. Uh, when I was a kid in high school, there was a tsunami in East Asia. Killed about a, something like a quarter of a million people. Um, one of those, every 10 days, killing exclusively children under the age of five. That's 9 million children a year. And that's only children that we're talking about. Children under the age of five. 9 million a year. So you've either got a God that loves you so much... He's willing to do all of these incredible things for you and just doesn't give half a shit about the nine million children starving to death in terror and agony. Doesn't care. Or you're more important, and this is fine. We'll deal with that later. Or maybe he just, that's part of the plan. That's part of the deal. He wants that to happen. I don't want anything to do with any plan that involves 9 million children a year starving to death. Not a good plan. If you're all-powerful, you can come up with a better plan. If you're all-knowing, you can come up with a better plan. Uh, and I'm not the first person to say this. Uh, Epicurus, way back, like, ancient Greece, said, where does evil come from? Either God is willing to prevent evil but not able, he's not powerful. He's able but not willing, he's not good. If he's neither good nor or never neither willing nor able, then why worship him? Why call him God? And again, throwing this out there, if your fallback argument to this is, well, there's free will. It all is its free will. You have to have the willpower to be the children are raped in this world. I would stop that if I was if I could. If I saw someone being raped, I would stop it. 
Your God doesn't. If you think that there's some moral lesson that we're going to get out of that, if you think that the kid needs to learn some moral lesson by this, if you think that the rapist is somehow getting some moral improvement and that violating his free will would be just, oh, that'd be the worst thing. I don't know how to help you with this. I don't know how to spell it out for you. That rape and murder is bad. Is there uh, something to come up? Yeah, right before you said that, someone literally just put the comment. We can't put the blame on Jesus or God. God gave us free will, and we make our own choices. Everything wrong in the world is our fault, and it's our responsibility to fix it. What choice did the child make to get raped? Also, if, if God can't intervene and interact because we have free will, then why would you pray about anything? That's a great because question. nothing can be changed. That's a great free question. Will. If you're praying, then you must think either you know better than God or you're going to convince him of something. Dumb. He's dumb if you can change him this way. And again, like I just said, what choice did that child make? Why did they deserve it? What moral lesson needed to be brought out of this? This is why I speak out against this. We talked at the very beginning, you know, why talk about these things? Why talk about religion? Why talk about, you know, why try to come out against faith? Because beliefs inform actions. And if you believe that somebody is in control of all of this, I don't want anything to do with whatever will be in control of all of this, first of all. Any God that would create a world like this is a monster. Complete, lunatic, psychopath monster. If you make a world with suffering and death and disease, and rape, and torment, and genocide, and the scale that we have, and that's part of your plan? I want nothing to do with you. If there was a God that could be proven to me today, I would be the first to admit it. I would be saying, yes, of course, there is a God. It's very clear. I want nothing to do with it. It is my enemy. I will fight against it till my dying day. If you think that our sins, our evil, is what brings all these problems into the world. That's a horribly broken, stupid system that this God created. Imagine doing that to, for your kids for a second. Just think about that. Think about this exact situation that you're trying to pitch to me, but you as a parent do it. Imagine that you tell me, or I tell you, think about this way. I come to you and I say, hey, my kid getting the crap kicked out of him on the playground, got his legs sliced up, got his A5, but you know what? He's evil. What are you going to do? Let it happen to him. Hey, my baby got raped. She was evil. It's fine. That's part of it. Part of life. It's all good. Hey, tell you what, though, if she isn't grateful for all this happening, I'm going to lock her in the basement and set her on fire. Would you think I was a good, kind, wise, loving parent? No. And that brings me back to what we were saying a minute ago. We talked about the underhanded statements. Things like, Jesus loves you. You only said half of it. That's half a statement. If you say, Jesus loves you, or God loves you, that's half of the statement. The other half is, he loves you so much that if you don't love him back, he will torture you for eternity in fire. I love my girlfriend so much that if I think she won't love me back, I'm going to lock her in the basement and torture her. Is that love? Or is that a creepy stalker? You tell me. Would you accept that as a form of love from anybody else? We said it a minute ago. You have a totally different set of rules for this religion. Morally, like scientifically, critically, you have a complete different set of rules. And my question is, why? Why? Why on earth would you allow this monstrous idea to creep into your life and to pass that on to your children? 
Why would you allow yourself, your family, strange priests, hysterical virgins in black suits with white collars, why would you let these people teach your children that they are sinful, diseased, disgusting, evil? They need to be cured. They need to be fixed. They were born, and that's the worst thing they could have ever done. And the only thing, the only way that they can be worth a damn is if they make sure to not have sex before they're married and, and, and you know, don't use the Lord's name in vain and, and you know, don't eat pork. But really? You have to believe that I, because I'm an atheist, I'm very happy to tell you, you need to believe that I am going to be tortured in fire for eternity and that I deserve it. I need it. It's right. And if you don't think that I deserve it, you need to ask yourself why you're worshiping the person that's going to do it to me. Because I know that if somebody was torturing people, I wouldn't be praising them. I don't think anyone deserves that. Certainly not children. What a weird thing to have to praise, though. Oh, yeah. Can you imagine if you created something, if you were a god of something or someone or, mm -hmm. or whatever, and you're... Your, one of your rules was that they have to praise and worship you? What an ego. What small dick energy. It's very strange. It's very strange. I don't have children. But if I ever do reproduce, I don't want my children to praise and worship me for making them. Because I'm not a douche. Uh, moving on from that one, let's see here. Claims that humans are special and made in the image of a deity. That's a problem. Because by thinking of yourself this way... You are putting yourself on this pedestal that you don't deserve to be on, and you're going to treat other people differently. You're going to treat the world differently. I said a minute ago that 44%, 44% of Americans believe that the world is going to end in their lifetime. Within the next 50 years, Jesus Christ is going to come down from the clouds and end the whole world. Are you going to care about climate change? Are you going to care about ending homelessness? Are you going to care about fixing world hunger? Are you going to care about crumbling infrastructure? If you think in the next 50 years, it's all going to just end anyway? No. Of course you wouldn't. Why would you? Spend your time happily. Live. Have fun. Do all sorts. Like Jesus said, take no thought for the morrow. No thrift. No investment. No stocks. No property. Sell everything you own. You're not going to need it in less than 50 years. Jesus said, some of you will live to see me come back. That was 2,000 years ago, but whatever. Like, if you think that this is real, it's going to change the way you behave. And that's a problem. It's better to believe more true things and less false things, generally speaking. If one of the false things you believe is that you are so freaking important that this whole universe was made for you, that's going to be an issue. You're not going to treat this world. You're not going to treat other people well. Uh, Christopher Hitchens very rightly said um, that if you want to believe in this monotheism especially, you have to believe. Because we have very clear evidence that the very first humans uh, came up about 200,000 years old or so in Africa. So 200,000 years ago, our species pops up in Africa. We evolve. We Even if you don't want to say that we evolve, those are the old, oldest bones that we have. The oldest bones from humans we have are about 200,000 years old. So 200,000 years ago, humans begin existing. For 198,000 years, God watches us with complete indifference. There they go. Oh, look. They're, they're, they're murdering each other. Oh, that group thinks that that group poisoned the water, so they're all they're killing each other. Oh, what are you going to do? Oh, that one's getting raped today. Oh, whatever. Folded arms, doesn't care. Then, 2,000 years ago, this god decides, all right, now I'm going to intervene. Now I'm going to teach them morality. And I'm going to do this by way of a filthy human sacrifice in the only part of Palestine that doesn't have any oil. 
I'm not going to go to the Chinese who can already read. I'm going to go to this one backwards warlike part of the world and I'm going to murder myself to myself as a sacrifice to myself so that I can forgive myself for the problem that I made in my own system instead of just changing the rules because I made the rules so I can do that. But instead of doing that, I'm going to make a loophole by killing myself as a sacrifice in this part. And if that doesn't work, then I just don't know what will. Nothing else can possibly work. That's the best I've got. What a dumb god. Honestly. That's the best you've got? This is the best you can do? This world is the best you can do? This is perfection. I am not impressed. And that is why I'm an atheist. One of the many reasons. Um, let's see here. Uh, can someone get addicted to blind through discard scientific evidence? That happens all the time. There's countless stories of people who were had great promise in their field and stopped because they couldn't handle their religion. At the university where I work, there was a student uh, last semester that was a, a graduate student getting a master's degree in biological anthropology, which is specifically the study of human evolution and primatology and like understanding the human as an animal. They were a master's student studying anthropology and they couldn't deal with the whole section over human evolution. And they just dropped it. They dropped out and went back to whatever job they had. You spent that much time learning anthropology, but because science is real, you can't handle it? If someone, if, if this religion can do something like that to somebody's mind, if it can distort the mind of mostly young men to blow themselves up because that's what God told them to do, if it can possess parents to throw their children out on the street because they came out as trans or gay, because that's what God wanted. If it can possess people to invest in conversion therapy. If it can possess people to do genital mutilation. Think about that one. There are countless people that will slice and dice the genitals of newborn babies to make them holier. Because that's what God wanted. Who in their right mind would ever take a baby fresh out of the womb, first experience breathing air, and say, almost perfect, not quite. We need to slice a little bit of his dick off. Then it'll be perfect. Unless the creator of the universe told you to do this. And if that's the case, what a fucking disgusting creator. First of all, Make us without the dick skin. If you don't want it, don't make us cut on a baby. And furthermore, if you do it the proper way, the actual, like, traditional way, is that you have a moil suck off the foreskin. And there have been a lot of babies that have died here in America from genital herpes that became a big complication and destroyed their immune system, and the baby died because somebody sucked their foreskin off. If you think that this is okay, the only justification would be because you think the creator of the whole universe told you it was a good thing to do. And that is evil. I meant no words about this. This teaching is evil. And it makes good, sane, rational, kind people believe and do horrible things disgusting, insane, evil things. No parent would ever, ever send their gay child to go have their brain electrocuted until they're straight unless they believed this book that says they should do it. It is evil. And every second that we're sitting here talking about it, every second that you're in the chat saying, ah, oh, you don't know God. Oh, you don't understand. It's not really that bad. It's not like that. Every freaking second that we're sitting here discussing it, having a comfortable conversation over the internet in an air-conditioned room, children are being abused in this way. Every single moment that you're sitting here justifying these actions, justifying this insanity, 
Babies are being mutilated. People are being told that they're evil and sinful and deserving of torture. You want to know why I speak out against religion? It's because things like that really exist and happen in the real world. We can argue about whether this God is real or whether the magic is real or whether the miracles happen. You know what we can all agree is real? Genital mutilation, sex slavery, women being beaten and tortured into relationships, virginity and purity culture, the immense amount of religious trauma that countless millions of Americans deal with every single day. And I'm just picking on America here because I live here. The world is rife with this. The KKK is a religious organization. The Lord's Resistance Army is a religious organization. Al-Qaeda is a religious organization. These things wouldn't exist if it weren't for these teachings that have no basis in morality at all. If this is the moral system that your God gave us, then I want nothing to do with your God. And if your God can't come down here and fix it, if this is all wrong, and we got it all backwards, and this is what is being allowed to happen, then I still want nothing to do with this God. These people that teach these things, they're not evil either, most of the time. Some of them fucking are. They've been lied to, too. They think that they're doing something good. And many of you watching this, now and, and in the future, because this I think we have 50 or so people on the stream now, but I'm going to leave this video up for people to see. Many of you watching this have been told these things, that you're born in sin, that you need to be fixed. I want you to know, sincerely, that you don't need salvation. You don't need a savior you don't need this because salvation is already at hand and it comes from you. You are the guide and the author of your own life. You don't need anybody else's permission. You are not sick. You are not broken. You are not diseased. You are not wrong. You owe nobody an apology for being yourself. So please, be yourself. That's all. You don't need this. Moving on. Um, let's see here. Hey, the sin of the sinner. We went through these things. Uh, biggest problems caused by religion. We went through several of these. Virginity. What's the take on virginity from a science and an atheist standpoint? This I, I can tell you countless horror stories that I've heard of women that get married and have sex for the first time and feel broken and like dirty now it's it's this is sick it's sick i stephen fry made an amazing point about this i have a healthy relationship with food i eat food i eat too much sometimes i don't eat enough sometimes i enjoy it it's fun i wouldn't call myself obsessed with food i would call someone obsessed with food if they were morbidly obese or anorexic and that's not the full spectrum, but these things, these ends of this extremes, these extremes are obsession with food. These religions are obsessed with sex in this exact same way. I have sex. Sometimes I do it too much. Sometimes I wish I did it more. Sometimes I do it just for fun. Most times I do it just for fun. I'm not obsessed with sex. It's a fun thing to do. These religions are obsessed with sex. So much so that you see children walking around with shirts that say virginity rocks, wearing purity rings, teaching six and seven-year-old little girls. You need to be careful and watch what you wear and watch how you behave because somebody's going to want to have sex with you. Oh, what sex? Let me explain it to you, little seven-year-old girl, and why you're wrong and dirty and filthy and disgusting and slutty and need to be treated differently. Who in their right mind would allow this? Honestly. Again, flip the script. Take religion out of the equation. 
If somebody wanted to come talk to your little girl and teach her all about sex and how disgusting she is for wanting to have it someday, not now, she's seven, you would call that person a creep and you would call the police and you'd be right to do so. But give them priest robes, put them in holy orders, please teach my little children about sex. Please teach them about this. I've already cut their genitals. I've done half the work for you. Are you kidding me? Uh, what about pantheism? It's just as wrong as anything else. It's not worth it. Um, is religion the same thing as superstition? Yes, only it's the only superstition that we like put into laws. Uh, if there is no God, what's the meaning of life? Why do you need a meaning? You're alive. Congratulations. Most people don't get to say that. The meaning of your life is to go out and find some meaning. Go do something. How boring would it be to know that you're born for this one specific purpose? And then you can die when you're done. And it just so happens that one specific purpose is just to praise the thing that made you. What an awful, miserable life. There is no meaning. You get to do it. You get to go make some meaning. Lucky you. Don't, don't, don't box yourself in. Which is more believable, the sky daddy or unicorns? Horses at least exist. A mutant horse, I could believe. A magic man in the sky, that's... Unicorns are way more believable. Uh, let's see here. Um, did Mary cheat on Joseph, lie about it to avoid punishment, and accidentally start a religion? This is a great question. Uh, I believe it was David Hume who said... If you either have to believe that all the laws of nature were suspended, or you made a mistake, was it that the laws of nature changed and somebody, you know, parthenogenesis just happened in a human all of a sudden? Or did a Jewish girl tell a lie? What's more likely, honestly? Oh, gosh. Let's see here. Um... I have a family member who's new age and believes that they didn't come from a monkey. They believe in evolution, but they're not a part of it. Blah, blah, blah. Again, you're suspending your critical thinking for one thing that you wouldn't do for anything else. Um, what do I think about Pastafarianism? It's hilarious. Um, no more ridiculous than any other religion, for sure. Uh, and finally, the last question that I wrote down that, that you know, there's a million here, but we kind of consolidated them. Uh, the last question, this was asked as a joke, but I'm going to answer it honestly. Will you accept Jesus into your heart? No. I don't want anything to do with the sick mockery of love that is pushed by this Jesus creature. And interestingly enough, in the New Testament, Jesus says that the only unforgivable sin, the only for sure one-way ticket to eternal damnation, is to renounce God. He calls it blasphemy at one point. He says denying the Holy Spirit at another point. He also goes on to say that there is no unforgivable sin, but either he was lying then or he's lying here. We're going to err on the side of there is such a thing as an unforgivable sin. He says multiple times that the only thing that cannot be forgiven is denying and renouncing God. So let me be very clear on this public forum so everybody can make sure there's no question, no equivocation. My name is Forrest Griffin Balkai. I renounce the Holy Spirit. I reject God. I want nothing to do with that sycophantic monster that you people push on me as something that's loving and caring and kind while he tortures and abuses his beloved creation. I want nothing to do with it at all. It's also not real, by the way. No, it's not real, but just in case anybody <laughs> thought it did. Just, just saying. In case you thought it was. I want nothing to do with it. No. Take it. Take it and go. Take all the, the sanctimony and ceremony and salvation you can carry and fuck off. I don't want it. I wouldn't want it even if it was real. Um, with that, uh, I've gone through most of our, our things here. Uh, did we have any cool questions come up from the chat? Um... A few comments, not a whole lot of questions. Um, at one point, someone was demanding a debate um, and then asked for a debate after that. Oh, that's kind. So, 
Um, we've already been streaming for 90 minutes. We're at 90 minutes right now. Okay. Um, let's take, uh, let's open up to a couple of questions, just like two or three, and then we'll, we'll wrap it up. Well, here, I'll do this then. Hey, you just want to bring that over here? I think I've got one. I've got this guy. I've got this one. Okay, this one. I'll just let you school. You sure? You want to use that one too? Okay. There we go. So, let's take a look, see? It's amazing the difference in time between these two things. Uh, let's see here. Uh, Jesus sounds so stalkery. I'm told he loves me even though I don't give consent. Yeah, you're on the same page, homie. Um, let's see here. Can I scroll better? Yes. Um, the sound foam in the background is uneven. I know it. Let's see here. Go ahead and uh, send, send in a few questions if you'd like. Um, and I would love to answer a couple of them and then we'll start wrapping up. Do I have a podcast? Yes, I do. It's called I'm Not Comfortable With This. First episode is up on this very channel. And if that continues on and we get a bunch of them, then we'll, we'll make a whole new channel for that. What would a world look like without religion? We would find something better to do with our time. Uh, without religion, we would be free to explore ourselves, to explore reality, to explore morality. Like, without religion, we would be free. And that's what I want all of you to see. I am free. I don't have this weight on my shoulders of guilt, of sin, of death. I don't have these problems. I'm free. I hope you are too. I hope you can become so if you're not. You sounded like you were a preacher there for a second. I'm cool. A preacher would be like, well, I'm free too because Jesus Christ came and died on the cross and took all those burdens from Another me. thing. That's, you know, but that's a great thing though. That's a great thing to bring up. That is a disgusting thing. People bring this up all the time. Well, isn't it lovely that Jesus died to give you the freedom from sin and that he took all your... No, that's disgusting. That is evil. I can take away your debt. I can pay your bills for you. If, if, if you commit a crime, I might go sit in a prison cell for you. I can't take away your guilt. I can't make what you did right. I can't take away your need to go rectify what you've done. That's not right. That's vicarious redemption is, is it's, it's not okay. And certainly by way of human sacrifice, be very clear. This is not a religion that says human sacrifice is wrong and shouldn't happen. It happens several times in the Bible. You know, you have Isaac and Ishmael where he doesn't quite sacrifice, but then you have Jephthah where God does make him sacrifice his kid. Remember that one? Jephthah says, God, I'll sacrifice the first thing that comes out of my house if you make me win this battle. And the first thing that comes back is his daughter comes out. And he sends his daughter in the mountains. This is real. He sends his daughter into the mountains to cry about the fact that she'll never have sex. And when she comes back, he kills her and burns her as an offering to God. God knew that would happen. And he let it happen anyway. The firstborn children in Egypt. All the firstborns in Egypt. These babies all had to die to prove a point to the Pharaoh. That's evil. That is evil. Uh, and then you have the big one. Jesus Christ. You know, the God, man, whatever. That is a human sacrifice. That is, it is not a religion that says human sacrifice is wrong. It is a religion that celebrates one human sacrifice as if it were effective. I don't, I don't, it's not a moral system. I don't want anything to do with that. So what would a world look like without religion? We would be free. Oh, uh, let's see here. We're also people, so we would still be fighting. And oh, for sure. We'd find something to be pissed off about. Why not? Uh, what do you think it's like after you die? What was it like before you were born? You weren't around for billions of years. You won't be around for another few billion years until the universe dies. It's not hard to think about. Right now, I am not in Australia. There are people in Australia that don't know I exist, and they're getting on just fine without me. I am not that important. I am not special. I don't need everybody. Like that's, when I die, I die. The, the electricity in my brain stops. I think they mean what happens to you, though, like your, your experience as a human. My grandma died of dementia. 
uh, of complications from Alzheimer's. Over the course of about five years, she slowly lost her mind until she finally died. Did little pieces of her go to the afterlife at a time, and then she quickly, uh, all of a sudden, got coagulated back into a thinking mind? Did she just have to suffer, and then all of a sudden she went all at once? If there was a soul, what would that be? We have no evidence of anything like that. Where would it exist in you? Where would it come from? Where would it go? Cotton Eye Joe. There's just no reason to, to put these in here. When you're dead, you're dead. And it's not scary. That's the thing. People talk about, you know, religion is a, a confronting death, dealing with death. You don't need to do that. Death is not a scary thing if you have time to cope with it. One of the biggest things I get, when I talk about religion, people say, oh, so you're going to tell me that I'm never going to see my brother again. I'm never going to see my dad again. Yes. And if you'd had the time to build coping mechanisms for that, that wouldn't be so scary as it is. You have been cheated out of the opportunity to develop healthy coping habits, and I am very sorry for you. We now need to put in the work to rectify this. We can't just go on doing this thing because it feels good. It's better to embrace a hard truth than live a reassuring lie. It is scary at first, I understand. But once you get through it, it's not, I promise you. It's okay. I'm going to die. Probably sooner than I think. I'm 28 years old. Average human lifespan's around maybe 80 in this country. That means I've used up about over a third of the time that I've got. Most of that was learning how to walk and talk. That sucks. I don't have a tremendous amount of time left, and that's assuming I don't get hit on a bus on my way to work tomorrow. I don't take a second for granted. I'm very happy to be here. But I don't have some illusion that I'm just going to do this forever. Uh, no. And I'm certainly not going to see all of you in some amusement park in space. No. There's no reason to believe this. And it's a corrupt evil moral system anyway. Um, what about the fish at the top of Mount Everest? Yes, that is the case for plate tectonics, driving up fossils. Um, what is your opinion on Greek mythological creatures? They're cool. They're not real, but they're cool. Um, do I think troglodytes have a god? So troglodytes are uh, chimpanzees. Pan-troglodytes is the, 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 the term, is their scientific name. Um, you know what? They might someday. You know, they continue to grow, and then we'll have to help. <laughs> um, let's see here. We'll do a couple more, and then we'll wrap up here. What is the best way to celebrate life? That's a great one. I think this is a great one to end on. What's the best way to celebrate life? Is to just live. Make mistakes. Get messy. Do things right. Do things wrong. You're going to hurt people. You don't have to apologize for that. You're going to make people very happy if you're lucky. And you can celebrate that too. The best way to celebrate life is to be yourself and make no apology for it think on your own make decisions on your own ask for help ignore it sometimes do stupid things because you think that they're right grow up later on and realize where you were mistaken and become a better person learn and grow never stop growing up until you die just keep keep changing the best way to celebrate life is to just be, just live. Don't think that you're beholden to some monster in the sky for the fact that you get to breathe today. There's no need for it. Like I said earlier, I'm going to say it again. You are not sick. You are not broken. You are not diseased. You are not cursed. You are not evil. You are not dirty. You are not sinful. You are okay just the way you are. And if you want to change, then that's on you. You could be better. You could be immeasurably better than you are today. And that's on you to decide. You don't need anybody's permission to be happy. You certainly don't need some God 
who allows this much evil to tell you how to be good. Because you are better than whatever this God is. Even if you believe in it. If you believe in a God, you're better than that God. I guarantee it. You know how I know? Because you've never set somebody on fire for lighting incense. Which God did. Several times in the Bible. You are better than that. You can be moral and free without it. So, as we wrap up today, my last call to action is to free yourself from this. Come with it. You'll be better off. And if you have any, send them to me through my website, renegadesciencefeature.com. It's got a contact box in the bottom. Send me an email. Send me a message on Instagram. Say hi to me on TikTok. I, I don't respond to everything, but I try to. So thank you so much for tuning in. Um, the very last thing, somebody said God does exist. Prove it. And even if he did, I want nothing to do with him because he's a monster. Uh, thank you so much for watching, for tuning in. Thanks so much for, for whatever likes and subscriptions and all the commenting and, 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 and for playing along. Uh, throughout this. I really appreciate it. My name is Forrest Alki. I renounce and reject the Holy Spirit. God is a monster, and I want nothing to do with him, and I'm good without God, and so can you be. Thank you. Have a great rest of your evening. Goodbye. Also not real, by the way. Also not real. You, you keep saying it like it's real. He's no. wrong and he's not real. No, not real. He's not real and he's evil. Wrong and evil. Would you, uh, would you mind hitting that little X there on the top right corner there, baby bear? Top right corner right there. Yep, that's the one. Bye!